Yeah, welcome back to a new series called The Most Powerful Black Man of the Last 500 Years Where we talk about life during the reign of King Henry Christoph. Now make sure you stay up to date so everything makes sense In part 1, we discuss the rise to power Part 2, we discuss the solidification of power Part 3, we discussed how the French government was moving and acting during the reign of power and part four is going to get emotional. It's going to be a lot of highs and lows. It's going to get real. You know, in this episode, we're going to discuss military operations undertaken by Christoph to rescue enslaved Africans from European slave ships, where European captains of slave ships were arrested and their ships were seized and the enslaved Africans were accepted as Haitian citizens. We also have an old document from the British media from 200 years ago when the Queen of Haiti or maybe agents sent on behalf of the Queen of Haiti went over to Europe to, to shop and it was basically the TMZ at the time. What did they say about the Queen of Haiti and the princesses of Haiti? And also, before we get into the real hot topics like the government letters, the government documents that were sent from the king to foreign diplomats and foreign governments, and what did those foreign diplomats and foreign governments respond to him? It's going to be a lot of important discussions that are going to be discussed in those topics. Also, in this episode, we are going to talk about the downfall of Christoph, the death of Christoph, his dissension from power, and that is going to get emotional. That's going to get real, but you know, listen, first part three, it was exciting, bro, full of action, but in this part, listen, it's going to be the, the sad part of the movie, all right? Listen, it is what it is, bro. We got to talk about it. We got to embrace it. We got to get into it, man. Welcome to part four. The most famous of Christoph's liberation operations occurred in October 1817. The Royal Gazette of Haiti reported that Haitian authorities had captured a Portuguese frigate near the northern city of Cap Henri. The ship was on its way from Cap Verde, off West Africa, to Cuba, Havana, when officials from the Kingdom of Haiti took control of it and set free 145 Africans, victims of the odious traffic in human flesh, the transatlantic slave trade. The captives were in an awful state. Many had already died and the survivors looked like ghosts ready to die of misery and starvation. Once ashore in Haiti, they were greeted by a crowd who assured them that they were free and among brothers and compatriots. Seven years earlier, the northern Haitian military had captured a different Portuguese slaver carrying two houses speaking children. A random white man lost at sea with two African children. Anyways, these new so-called Nouveau Haitiens were as stunned to hear their native language as they were surprised to find some of their former countrymen already living in Haiti. It was as if they were meeting once again the parents from who they had been ripped away. Such operations had by that time become common. The northern military intervened to stop the slave trade again on the 2nd of February, 1811, when they captured a Spanish ship, the Santa Ana, and liberated 205 Africans shackled in the hold. Out of revenge, Spanish and Portuguese slave traders began to attack Haitian merchant ships and engage in slave raids on Haitian beaches, seizing men, women, and children to sell back into slavery. In 1812, a Spanish ship captured the Haitian brig Bulldog and sold its captain, Azor Michel, and two children on board in Cuba. Azor and the two children were returned only after Christophe intervened to request the return of all Haitian subjects who are or may still be detained in Cuba. And you guys wonder why I say things like, morality does not exist so because christoph was undertaking military operations to rescue enslaved africans from european slave ships europeans were responding by kidnapping people that were on the beach in haiti also kidnapping captains of our navy and their children that were on board and trafficking them to be sold to plantations in cuba so you wonder why i say things like morality does not exist it's about power it's about whatever you can get away with listen i say things for a reason anyways let's get back into it let's see how the queen of haiti and the princesses and members of the royal court let's see what the european media was saying during that time very superb dresses for the queen and princesses of haiti have just been finished by one of our fashionable dressmakers they are as follows queen of haiti's dress consists of petticoat of white satin richly embroidered in gold sunflowers terminating at the bottom with the broad gold fringe the train of white satin embroidered like the petticoat looped up on each side to form a drapery with gold tassels and bullion a beautiful gold net falls from the left shoulder and fastened under the right arm held up by the large cords of bullion over the shoulder the corners and edges finished with tassels and fringe a rich plume of white feathers ornamented by combs of immense value completes this dress the princesses of Hades dress the first a petticoat of lilac satin richly trimmed with three rows of gold and silver fringe so arranged to form draperies the body ornamented in like manner finished at the bosom with the gold and silver cestus with the finely executed rose from which is suspended an elegant sash of gold so listen 
in modern translation, listen, Kristoff had the family dripping. Kristoff had the family dripping. All right. I mean, I know you see the pictures, bro. I know you see the paintings in the listen. I know you see the artwork. Listen, bro. Kristoff, let me tell you. Let me tell you the difference between all the generals, Kristoff, Dessaline, Toussaint, everybody, even Petro. They were all very humble, right? Petron, he pretty much like Dessaline lived in the house, right? Dessaline's headquarters was a house. Now, what he did was he had a, a house for the for the for the bros to come to, you know, the generals, the gangsters to come through, and then he had another house for his family on the same block, right? But his wife wasn't gonna be like at the same spot where the generals was hanging out, because God forbid an attack comes through, you know what I mean? They go come shooting and busting. No, he wanted his family to have their own spot, right? But it was a house among the people. Christoph is the one, as you can see, had this massive, gigantic palace like the damn palace of Versailles in France, you know what I mean? But he always was that type of guy. I even mentioned it in a previous video that I did on the life of Dessaline. During Dessaline's inauguration, Dessaline wanted to come into town, ride in on his horse like a general, be among the people as he always did, as he always has. But Christoph was the one, he was like, bro, Bro, we, bro, we, we had the state now, bro. You know what I mean? You got to come through on the golden chariot, bro. I got the horses on deck, bro. We're going to do it big, bro. You got to get the, the major chariot. You got to come through. You are, we, we bosses now, bro. You know what I mean? We ain't just regular soldiers. We can't be among the generals now. Nah, bro. We elite now, bro. We at the top of the top. We at the top of the food chain and we must operate as such. Y'all remember in part one or part two, we discussed Christoph's coronation. It was written that the festivities went on for eight days straight. People was falling asleep on the palace lawns, bro. People was partying for a whole week straight. Whereas most of the other generals were humble. Even Petron, who came from somewhat of a elite background in social class, even he wasn't as ostentatious as they describe Kristoff. You know, Kristoff, he loved to be dressing the best. He loved to be looking the best. You could understand his personality because his two main homes were the palace at Sanssouci, that gigantic palace, and also the Citadel. He also used the Citadel as a place of residence. Yes, on that top 3,000 feet in the Sky Mountain, he was living inside that big fortress that could hold like 10,000 soldiers. He would be chilling up in there. And the reason Kristoff had that type of demeanor was because before the revolution popped off y'all remember when he came back from the american revolution christoph did not return to the plantation after about 12 13 years old the plantation was done for christoph he went to the american revolution he was owned by a french naval officer they were up in savannah georgia he was up in there for years it wasn't like a few months a military campaign for a few months he were up there for years christoph was moving all over the southern united states they stopped in georgia that was where the siege of savannah happened that was where the main battle happened but he was moving all through florida he was he really had his formative teenage years up in the southern united states so when he came back, he started working at a hotel, the most lavish, the most elite hotel in all of the colony. Of course, he was like a waiter washing dishes, but that was where all the elite French diplomats, the elite men of the colony would come and hang out. So by the time Christophe is like 2021, around the years 1787, 1788, the revolution ain't even popped off yet. The first major movement in the rebellion would start around 1791, a few years later. Now, during this time of the years leading up to the revolution, Christoph is dating the daughter of his boss, who owns the most lavish hotel in all of the colony. This is one of the most elite black families in all of the colony, and he's dating the daughter of that elite man. And as we know, in previous videos I did discuss in his life, Christoph, his main hustle was traveling along the Haiti Dominican border, basically selling goods, selling horses, selling meat, selling all type of goods. Same thing he was doing in the Southern United States when they were down there for years. That was when he first started getting his first taste of business, his first taste of trade. When he left the colony, came back, started doing business, got a job, making money, dating the daughter of this rich dude. You know what I mean? So by the time the revolution popped off, he's 24. He already got bread, bro. He already understands what it's like to be free, but you got to understand he's a different type of dude because he could have easily packed his bags, hopped on a boat migrated to like louisiana migrated to philadelphia and just got away from the war got away from the instability but what christoph decided to do is he decided to not only stay in the colony but i'm gonna go join the rebels i'm gonna go join the rebel slaves up in the mountains and we're gonna go get it popping because he was already a military man he was down at the american revolution he already knows what that's about so christoph quit his job quit everything he was doing quit his hustles and he was like yo i'm about to run up in the mountains and i'm gonna go meet Toussaint and Dessaline. i'm gonna go ride with them and the rest is history at the age of 24 he enlisted in the Haitian Revolutionary Army. So it's only natural by the time he makes his rise to power, when he got the bread in his pocket, you could understand. Christoph, he loved doing it big. He loved having money. He loved being fly. He loved being free. He loved the finer things in life, period. But I mean, in general, isn't that a thing that all black men are into? Don't we love the finer things in life? Don't we love dripping? Don't we love, you know what I mean? Flashing, stunting, flexing. It is what it is, man. Let's get back into it. From his English friends, Christoph had learned of the Lancasterian system of education and of its efficacy in teaching the rudiments of knowledge. And in 1815, he made application for assistance to the British and Foreign School Society, an organization devoted to the Lancasterian plan. 
through this society and with cooperation with Wilberforce and Clarkson, six teachers were sent to Haiti. And in 1816 and 1817, schools were established at Sans Souci and in the principal ports of the kingdom, Cap Henri, port et Gonaïve, and saint Marc. Soon nearly 2,000 students were in attendance. Christoph spared no effort or expense. Buildings were constructed, books and equipment were provided, and the teachers heavily compensated. About the same time, a royal college was founded to afford students with special aptitudes an opportunity to pursue a more advanced curriculum. And at Sanssouci, a school of drawing and painting was established with the English artist Richard Evans in charge. So gratified was Christophe by the success achieved under the Lancasterian plan and by the abilities of the English teachers that he determined to make education available to all Haitian children throughout the kingdom and to place it under a uniform organization free of charge. With his usual emphasis on the concentration of administrative power, he appointed a royal chamber of public instruction to systemize by means of regulations and surveillance all efforts made for education. The chamber was composed of 16 members and included the most able men in the government. To implement his design, he issued on November 20th, 1818, an ordinance carefully outlining the multifaceted duties of this royal chamber. It was especially charged with establishing primary schools in the parishes where none exist and academies and secondary schools throughout the kingdom wherever they may be needed and with the direction and supervision of these schools and all other institutions of learning including private schools then in operation it was entrusted with the maintenance of order morality and the quality of teaching all licenses for teachers and no teacher was permitted to conduct classes without one were to be issued by the chamber and it was to appoint three supervisors for each schools as well as special inspectors who were to make frequent tours of the establishments nor did Christoph merely delegate his authority every six months the chamber was to inform the king concerning the general progress of public education and he was to be furnished with the names of the masters who had distinguished themselves and the scholars who had shown the greatest zeal for knowledge so Christoph is encouraging good grades by basically saying, listen, if you get up in these schools, bro, and you start smashing these grades, listen, you might get a chance to, you know what I mean, come hang out at the royal court. You know what I'm saying? You might get a chance to, you know what I mean, have your family, your, your family's name up in lights, you know? So he's encouraging excellence. Christoph did not believe in boys and girls going to school together. One article written by Christoph states, children of opposite sexes shall never be brought together in the same schools. On January 1st, 1819, Christoph issued a second ordinance just as the first one instituted a royal chamber of public instruction and outlined his duties, so the second laid down the most rigid regulations for the parents, the schoolmasters, the supervisors, the inspectors, the pupils, and the monitors. Exacting in every detail, it provided for admission of children from 6 to 15 years of age, each child to present a doctor's certificate of good health. The parents were obligated to lodge, nourish, and clothe their children. School hours were clearly defined. On the long days of the year, morning classes shall be in session from 6 o'clock until 11 o'clock, and afternoon classes from 2 to 6. On short days, the hours shall be from 7 to 11, and from 2 to 5. Absence from class was not to be tolerated, except on specific days of rest and the national holidays decreed by law. And on Sundays and feast days, the pupils were required to attend prayers and a religious discourse. The section of the ordinance dealing with punishments was most severe. Discipline shall be inculcated among the pupils by means of the rod or whip. Disobedience, absence from class, and taking the name of God in vain was punishable. And monitors who failed to fulfill their duties were to be given double punishment. Instruction in all schools was to be given in both English and French, and according to the English system. The elementary pupils were to be taught to read, to write, and to figure. In the academics, instruction was to include grammar, history, geography, arithmetic, Latin, English, and the French languages. These two ordinances, so comprehensive in their provisions, demonstrate equally with the code's capacity for leadership and his project for universal education was fast being realized. New schools were rapidly established, and not only were the elementary and secondary schools thriving, but in the Royal College, a number of students were progressing so satisfactorily that they were nearly ready to become themselves teachers of mathematics, chemistry, and literature. A medical school under the supervision of the King's physician was also going steadily ahead. Foreign visitors who inspected the schools brought back to England glowing reports of the aptitude and the knowledge of the Haitian students and declared that the Haitian pupils were equal in performance to English children of the similar age. Clarkson, who received copies of these ordinances, was delighted to find the king striving to better the condition of his subjects. Anxious to assist Christoph in every possible way, he acceded to a request for two professors of English and French for the Royal College by employing two talented young Englishmen, William Wilson and George Clark, and sending them to Haiti under seven-year contracts. On their arrival, Christoph installed Wilson as tutor to the Prince Royal, Jacques Victor, and Clark as professor in the college. 
When Clarkson learned that Wilson had been made the prince's tutor, he wrote a long letter in which he urged Wilson to give the future king the most careful training in both history and religion. Whereas Wilberforce served Christoph principally in bringing Haiti to the intention of influential persons and in providing qualified teachers, physicians, and farmers for service in the island, Clarkson became Christoph's European advisor. As the king's foreign agent, he sent immediate and accurate information concerning the state of English and French public opinion, the attitude of the foreign powers toward Haiti, and the likelihood of any military attempts by France, either diplomatically or militarily, to subdue the country. Clarkson gave his advice freely and at length, nor was the correspondence between the two men limited to a discussion of foreign affairs. Many of the letters relate to the internal administration of the kingdom. Clarkson was greatly disturbed over the size of Christoph's standing army, though he was well aware of the necessity for preparedness. In one of his letters, Clarkson explained the advantage of organizing the soldiers into a militia as in England, therefore releasing one third or one half of the troops for military service. He went on to suggest that the disbanded troops be given grants of land. A few months later, Christoph replied that he was bringing this advice to the attention of the Privy Council and within a year reassured that the French would not undertake any hostile action against Haiti. He issued an edict giving portions of the public domain to his soldiers of all ranks. This edict is a further tribute to Christoph's intelligence. Although the concessions of land were made irrevocably and the new owners were at liberty to sell or dispose of their holdings as they pleased, the righteous regulation of the codes were enforced upon those who retained their property. Christoph wrote that he planned to familiarize his troops with the transition from the soldier's life to that of the farmer by giving them leave, a group at a time, to go and cultivate their lands for brief periods, and that when he could do so with the complete security, he would embrace in its entirety the plan for maintaining a militia. When Clarkson heard from an American friend of a project to send free people of color from the United States to Haiti, he saw another opportunity to be of service. He pointed out to Christoph the substantial advantages of increasing his population by these immigrants from the United States. They would assist heavily in introducing the English language into the kingdom of Haiti, and since many of them were skilled workers, they would prove useful by their example. Clarkson also wrote to Richard Peters, the president of the Triennial Convention, a congress of various abolition societies in the United States, urging him to send delegates to Haiti for the purpose of investigating conditions there. Nor was this all. He suggested that the United States might be prevailed upon to purchase Spanish Santo Domingo as an asylum for free black American Negroes, and then to sell the territory to Christophe. Now see, these are the type of homies you need, bro. These are the type of discussions you need to have. You see, Clarkson was like, listen, bro, listen. I'm going to get in contact with the homies in the United States. What we could do is, listen, if we could get the United States to capture Spanish Central Domingo, we could probably finagle some moves, and they could sell it to you, and then you could have the whole island on and popping. Now, of course, that's not how the history played out. But, listen, it would have been a crazy move. It would have been like the Louisiana Purchase in reverse. You know what I mean? Shout out to Thomas Clarkson. But either way, as we know, years later down the line, the mulattoes did end up taking over the entire island and annexing Spanish Santo Domingo regardless. But let's get back into it. Such an arrangement would both enhance Christoph's territory and enhance his reputation abroad. But nothing came of Clarkson's hopes. A revolution in Spain put an end to any chance of selling Santo Domingo. But it is extremely unlikely that the United States would have considered such an arrangement with the black king. Yet Christoph received Clarkson's suggestions and wrote to American abolitionists offering to defray the cost of transportation for the Negro immigrants, whom he was willing to receive without any stimulations regarding the Spanish part of the island. So Christoph is like, listen, bro, I don't even need that part of the island. If the homies from the United States want to come to the kingdom of Haiti, I don't need any special parts in the arrangement. I don't need any kickbacks or personal benefits. Just let them come through, bro. I'll even put down money on the cost for the transportation. Just let them come through. It is what it is, bro. Let the homies come through. Again, listen, Christoph the realist, bro. Christoph a gangster, man. Christoph a gangster. At the end of the day, we got to study how elegantly Christoph maneuvers through the negotiations and dealings with the Europeans while always still remaining Listen, I got to ride for my race. I got to ride for my people. I know how I came here and I know what my people are going through in different locations. And he never forgot that. You got to keep in mind, next door in Spanish Santo Domingo, Africans are still enslaved working on them plantations. Still to this day, bro. Still while Christoph is on the throne, next door over the border, Africans are still enslaved, bro. So Christoph, you know, it's always in the back of his mind, bro. We still got to smash the slave trade. We still got to smash slavery. There were many thousands of the free people of color who wanted to go to Haiti. But the death of Christoph prevented the signing of an agreement, whereby he was to provide a ship and transport them and advance $25,000 to each immigrant family. So yes, as we know, Christoph's plans to bring the, the black Americans over to Haiti, 
it didn't happen because Kristoff actually ended up suffering a stroke weeks before everything was supposed to happen. Everything was supposed to come through. Everything was ready to go, but emergency struck and the kingdom fell, unfortunately. But we're going to get into the details of the downfall later on in this episode, but that's why it never happened. This was supposed to be arranged through Prince Saunders, who was one of his political advisors, who was a black American himself, who had been living in Haiti already for three to four years as a member of the government and the ruling class. He was actually the one who arranged the whole plan and he actually got news that Kristoff had died when he was on his way back. And you know, it is what it is. But black Americans did end up coming in later administrations in the years 1825, 1859, and 1861. And I should do videos on that in the future. Perhaps I will. Let's get back into it. Clarkson constantly reiterated to Christoph the necessity of avoiding any military contention with the Republic of Haiti, Petron's government in the South. And his advice apparently bore fruit. At the time of Petron's death in 1818, Christoph had urged by means of a proclamation to the Haitians of the Republic and a letter to their generals and magistrates that the country unite with the kingdom, an offer which they rejected. In 1820, however, Sir Homerick's Puffam of the Jamaica Station undertook the good offices of mediator between the rival governments, probably at the instigation of Christoph. He first went to Port-au-Prince to confer with President Jean-Pierre Boyer, Petron's successor and protege, whom he found quite willing to arrange a pact with the king for their mutual defense. He then communicated Boyer's proposals to Christophe. Finally, on the day before departure for England in the early summer of 1820, he wrote to Boyer advising him that the treaty ought to have for its principal objects the establishment of peace between the subjects of the two states and an agreement to unite their forces in one in case of a French attack and warned him, don't plan ever to make war. Don't try to advance beyond your frontiers because if you do, I shall consider you as the aggressor and you will be held responsible in the eyes of the whole world. So King Kristoff, you know, he sent the white man down to the mulattoes in the south. And the white man was like, listen, bro, listen, y'all touch a hair on Kristoff's head. We're going to have the whole damn Royal British Navy all over your ports surrounded. And it's going to be a wrap for you. So listen, we got Kristoff's back. Just letting you know, though. But y'all better unite in case the French are coming. Because the French, I'm hearing the French are coming. But listen, if you touch Kristoff, if you move beyond your frontiers, beyond your borders, it's a problem for you. Because we riding with Kristoff. You know, we just came down here. You know, we, we, we cool with you. But Kristoff's really our boy. Kristoff's really our, our mans, right? So listen, stay in your place. Stay in your, stay in your little corner of the island and do your thing. But you better be on peaceful time, all right? You better be on peace time. Because if it's war time, it's war time. And we riding with Kristoff. You heard? British Empire, British Navy. You dig? <laughs> Let's get back into it. He assured Boye that Kristoff was sincerely deposed to enter into an agreement of the most perfect friendship and that the delegates whom Boye apparently intended to send into the north would be guaranteed absolute security. Unfortunately, no formal treaty materialized before Kristoff died in October 1820. But it is significant that he should have made a complete about face in the years 1818 and 1820 and abandoned all ambition to unite Haiti under his authority. Haitian foreign policy, however, is the most important and constant subject of a discussion in the correspondence. In his first letters, Christoph emphasizes the necessity of guaranteeing the safety of Haitians before turning to their moral and cultural improvement. He begs his friend to continue to impart to me those observations which your experience with the policy of the European cabinets may suggest to you, and implores him to give me timely notice of any machinations which our enemies may devise against us. The collaboration between the two men offers a remarkable example of mutual understanding and good faith. Clarkson warned Christoph to maintain the strictest neutrality with his Caribbean neighbors and outlined for him the state of French opinion towards Haiti and the improbability of any warlike proceeding against her. Christoph, on the other hand, wrote at length of his hope that England might recognize Haitian independence, though Clarkson clearly showed how impossible such action would be in the face of French resentment. Christoph dispatched for Clarkson's judgment several letters from France, which were obviously designed to affect some sort of understanding towards a commercial treaty. One example of the harmonious relations between the two men may be cited. Ever anxious to have Christoph's character and aspirations known to the kings of Europe, Clarkson suggested that Christoph write directly to Emperor Alexander of Russia. Christoph at first questioned the propriety of doing so without some preparation. In France, Clarkson had a delightful conference with the emperor, an account of which he transmitted in one of his letters. At this conference, he let one of Christoph's letters to Alexander, who was so much struck with it that he carried it to Emperor of Austria and the King of Prussia for the perusal, and they pronounced it to be as good a letter as their own cabinet ministers could have written on the occasion. Having been properly introduced, Christoph thereupon wrote a magnificent letter to Emperor Alexander. The letter was sent unsealed to Thomas Clarkson, saying, if you judge that it may be sent to him, I beg you to forward it to his destination. It begins with an acknowledgement of the emperor's universal benevolence and his humane and beneficent disposition towards the unfortunate Africans and their descendants, the Haitians. He then summarizes briefly the tragic story of the years preceding the Declaration of Independence in 1804. 
Christoph adds a brief account of his own efforts to give my fellow citizens of code of laws suited to their wants and to their morals, then follows the noble defense of the Negro. Too long has the African race been unjustly attacked. Too long has it been represented as deprived of intellectual faculties, as scarcely susceptible of civilization or government by regular and established laws. These false assertions spring from the avarice and injustice of men who have had the impiety to degrade the finest work of the creator, the black man and woman, as if mankind had not one common origin. These persons attribute to difference of color that which is only the result of civilization and knowledge. In concluding the letter, Christophe tells how he had hoped that after Napoleon's defeat, the new French government would have directed by principles of moderation, justice, and humanity, and that the king would have acknowledged the independence of the people of Haiti, since Louis XVIII openly showed his disposition to make use of the same systems of duplicity and lies as had formerly been employed. Christophe's hopes that Alexander will grant his powerful and generous protection and benevolence to the cause of the unfortunate oppressed Africans and their descendants, the Haitians. Clarkson was a man of the highest integrity and well versed in European politics and intimately acquainted with many of the leaders in England and France. Christoph had long realized that his own position was precarious and that his aspirations for the Haitians could not be achieved until Haiti was recognized as an independent nation. Such recognition must come first, however, from France. Yet, where was he to begin? He had indignantly driven off the French agents who came in 1814, assassinating the French ambassador, Franco de Medina, and again in 1816, in the early months of 1819. In reply to repeated French overtures made through General Vincent for a commercial treaty, he boldly asserted that the preliminary basis must be a recognition of Haitian independence. He determined, nevertheless, to take the initiative, and on November 20th, 1819, he appointed Clarkson his delegate to France. He accompanied the appointment with a letter of instructions and dispatched 6,000 pounds to cover the expenses of the mission. Man, big racks, bro. 6,000 pounds, 1819. That gotta be. I don't even want, man. Listen, punching the numbers in the calculator, man. Big racks, big paper. Let's get back into it. France was not to expect more than a share of Haitian commerce. The treaty was to contain no provision for any payment to French slaveholders, and any agreement must be made for the whole of Haiti, regardless of the disagreements between the two governments. Clarkson was astounded by Christophe's arbitrary terms, which in return for the recognition of Haitian independence, France was only provided a share of Haitian commerce and neutrality in a time of war. He had earlier advised Christophe to consider paying France an indemnification to reimburse the ex-colonists for their loss of their land. But despite Christophe's uncompromising attitude, he accepted the trust placed in him and in two detailed letters outlined the course of action he pursued. In the first letter, he stated that he had taken upon the matter with Wilberforce and others in England and all were agreed that the present unsettled state of France and the new administration of ultra-royalists, all enemies to Christophe, made any immediate proposal unwise. Unless Christophe offered some type of tangible advantage to France, all hope of a treaty then is at an end. And Christophe told him to continue as you are. Clarkson, however, proposed to go to France in a private capacity to sound out French opinion. Nevertheless, he intended to take the official papers with him to be ready to act as Haitian envoy should a special occasion arise. The second letters reports the results of Clarkson's French journey. He ferreted out information which he summarized under three headings. Will France ever fit out an expedition for the conquest of Haiti? Will France ever acknowledge the independence of Haiti? Upon what terms will France consent to acknowledgement of such independence? The answer to the first question was an unequivocal no. Not only was France in no position to undertake a costly adventure of a military expedition, but the very suggestion of an expedition in Haiti would meet with the unanimous disapproval by the military. As hopeless and disastrous as the first expedition in 1804 had become a proverbial French expression. So that right there debunks that common lie. According to mainstream European sources, they say, oh, the French sent warships to Haiti, they surrounded the island, and they paid the slaveholders money. Man, do you hear that, bro? The French was like, bro, we ain't going back there to Haiti, bro. We're not, we're not going back there to fight Christophe, bro. We already fought the dude like 10 years ago, bro. Them dudes was decapitating us and putting our heads on pikes, bro. We lost like our brothers, our cousins, man. What? They buried them in the sea. Like, bro, we're not going back down there, bro. You crazy, bro. You wild, bro. We ain't going back down there. Nah, hell nah. <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> Regardless, the generals of the French army might be ready to go. They might be ready to blow. But the actual soldiers that actually got to be on the battlefield, they're like, nah, bro, we ain't going back down there, bro. They're like, nah, bro. They even had the black women shooting at us, bro. We ain't going back down there. You wild, bro. They had little 13, 14 year olds shooting us in the face, bro. You crazy, bro. We ain't fighting the Haitians, man. Hell nah. Y'all better come to a verbal agreement and get something popping on paper. We ain't going back down there to fight the Haitians, man. Uh, hell no. Nah. <laughs> Let's get back into it. Clarkson found that the general opinion to be that no French regiment would consent to go to Haiti. The answer to the second question was that Christophe would gain a favorable treaty if he would acknowledge the King of France as the King of Haiti, and that if France was to recognize the independence of Haiti, Christophe would pay very dearly for it. The answer to the third question was more complicated. 
Kristoff dealt first with the terms which the ultra royalist ministry would be likely to demand in making a treaty with Haiti. He then outlined the somewhat milder terms the liberals might propose should they come into power. The letter is filled with temperate counsel. Among other things, Clarkson advised Kristoff to have Baud and Vasti compose a little work to refute the charge that yours was no government but a mere dictatorship. He pointed out that the French cabinet are much better disposed to the republic than to yourself. I mean, obviously, of course the French government would be more favorable to the republic in the south. The mulatto generals are their sons. The mulatto generals are their nephews. The mulatto generals are their grandsons. Those are the mulatto generals are the ones who inherited their estates. And hopefully, they can negotiate with them and get their estates back. I mean, come on, man. We already know. Of course, we get it. We understand the relationship between the French colonists and the mulatto generals of the Republic. It is what it is. Christophe also suggested that should France, contrary to all human reason and contrary to all human expectation, should ever meditate an attack upon Haiti, he wanted the British Empire to dispatch a light and quick selling vessel to Haiti to make known such intention. When this letter, which was written on July 10th, 1820, arrived in Haiti, Christophe was no longer alive. And as Clarkson remarked in his autobiography, my labors for him and the people of Haiti were all in vain. Now, this is the sad part of the movie right we are going to get into the downfall the death of king henry christoph let's jump into it but don't get upset don't get upset it gets greater later in fact after this we are going to jump in to the official government documents the official government letters written between the king emperor of russia thomas clarkson british diplomats the secretary of foreign affairs all of that bro it's gonna be lit all right it's gonna be lit so let's jump into the death of king henry let's get into it disaster came to christoph in the midst of his labors on August 15th, 1820, he was seized with a stroke while attending mass during his wife's celebrations. He consulted with his physician, Duncan Stewart, who informed him that his whole right side was paralyzed and that while the seizure would probably not prove fatal, his active days of military were over. Christoph received the news with stoical composure, showing no emotion, and as soon as he was able to travel, had himself conveyed to the palace. No longer overawed by their king, the soldiers began to talk amongst themselves of open revolt. Although at the onset of his career, Christoph governed in a tolerable manner and conducted his administration with a view to establishing order and discipline. Towards the end of his reign, he became more and more overbearing and gave way to uncontrolled fits of temper and rage. Now listen, Christoph got every right to be angry, all right? This is a man that was born into slavery. This is a man who witnessed his baby sisters born into slavery. He actually had to purchase their freedom. He did that around his mid-20s, early 20s. This is a man who his parents were enslaved. This is a man who witnessed his race be denigrated, disrespected, and attacked, probably witnessed all type of brutality committed amongst the women of his race against these French enemies. This is a man who is living with a lot of trauma. And at the end of the day, the European sources of history will never acknowledge that. This is a man who, for the last 30 years of his life, has been living under constant anxiety, paranoia, and stress. This is a man who has been staring barrel to barrel, gun to gun, with several militaries and several armies. This is a man who witnessed the French military assassinate African children as young as two years old. This is a man who has witnessed the French military drown thousands of African women in the Caribbean Sea. Women of his race, women of his nation. This is a man who is carrying a lot of pain. All right, let's get back into it. Christophe had learned to govern others, but not himself. He spared no one, and the nobles and royal Dalmet troops were as likely to become a victim of his wrath as the common field workers in the dungeons of the Citadel Henry. Those who had incurred the king's displeasure languished and died. He continued to supervise everything. Early in 1820, he had ordered the rebuilding of cap -Henri, which had never been fully restored since the time of the war in 1804. Daily he appeared on the scene of construction, exhorting the workers and punishing the idlers during the last seven months preceding his stroke. He was more than usually active. He seemed to be everywhere. He had turned from a benevolent sovereign to a tyrant and made enemies throughout length and breadth of the kingdom. Many of the acts of cruelty attributed to Christophe, however, were committed by his subordinates and without his knowledge or approval. The unrest in his kingdom, too, was as much due to the intriguers and the machinations of those in important positions as to his tyranny. Those unscrupulous men, members of the aristocracy, officials in the government, and army officers had become jealous of his power and secretly awaited an opportunity to overthrow his government. Although they owed their positions and wealth to him, they resented his ascendancy over them and believed that they, rather than he, should rule the country. The queen, indeed, was uneasy over the intrigues being practiced at the court, but even if she had understood their serious nature, she was powerless to do anything. Christoph also seems to have apprehensions of disaster during the weeks following his seizure and to have indulged in moments of self-questioning. He told Stuart, his physician, that he was conscious of having been unnecessarily harsh in governing his people 
any liberal in his treatment of the soldiers. He still kept the reins of government firmly in his control, however, and he greeted with the wild outburst of wrath the suggestion of some of his more temperate advisors that a provisional government should be established with the Prince Royal Jacques Victor at the head. Every order, every disposition emanated as before from his proper person. His son was deputed only to preside over execution. So Kristoff, such a gangster, hit the right side of his body paralyzed. You know, the cabinet ministers, the Privy Council, they're like, listen, bro, listen, let's establish a provisional government. You sick, you on bed rest. It's time to rest, bro. Listen, you've been fighting since you was like 24, bro. You like 53 now, my guy. You haven't rested and took a day off in over 30 years, bro. Like, bro, let's establish a provisional government. Let's put Jacques Victor at the throne. And let's, you know, let's move forward. Christoph half paralyzed, can't even walk. He like, man, forget that. I'm still at the top. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> at Cap Henry, the Duc de Mamelade, whom Christoph had publicly humiliated and other high officers had secretly been plotting since the beginning of the king's illness to destroy the monarchy and establish a republic in its place. Baron Dupuy, one of the king's most loyal supporters, probably knew something of this scheme, but he did not communicate his suspicions to Christoph because of his firm conviction that no measure of the king could change his destiny. Now, this is what you might call karma, because during the assassination of Dessalines, Christoph had knew that something was brewing, but he didn't warn Dessalines. And now Christoph, in a position of weakness, now his closest advisors, they know something's brewing, but they're not giving him the heads up, they're not giving him the warning. So this is what you might be able to label as karma. Before Mamlat's plans were perfected, however, a revolt against the king burst forth in an unexpected quarter. The garrison at St. Mark on the western coast, infuriated at the punishment of one of their officers by Christophe, revolted on October 1st, killed the commander, and wishing to unite with the Republic of the South, sent a conciliatory message to President Jean-Pierre Boyer. To thwart the secession, General Romain, Christophe's minister of war, who was then in the Artibonite, hurriedly assembled the troops and placed St. Mark under siege. Learning of this uprising, Christophe acted promptly and on October 6th commanded the soldiers at Cap Henri to march on St. Mark. But instead of obeying his order, they rebelled against his authority and themselves broke into open revolt. So widespread was the spontaneous insurrection that Marmelade, the royal governor at the Cap, and his fellow conspirators, whose own coup d'etat was anticipated, took charge of the insurgent army. To indicate their hatred of the king, the generals tore from their uniforms the crosses of the Order of St. Henri and trampled them in the dust. The cry from every throat was down with the king, and after a night of rioting and dancing at Cap Henri, the troops with Mamlad at their head on a Saturday, October 7th, began their march on Au Cap, a hamlet three miles away on the road to the Sanssouci Palace. Stunned by the news of another rebellion, Christophe hesitated for the first time in his life. All day, October 7th, he kept to his private quarters at the palace, but his undominable will had not deserted him, and at last, at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, he determined to act. Still half paralyzed, unable to mount his horse at the ride of the head of his soldiers, he ordered his household troops to pass a review before him, for he knew only too well how much of his power depended upon his personal bearing. Leaning heavily on the arm of a domestic who supported his right side, still paralyzed, and brandishing a pistol in his left hand, he directed that four dollars be paid to each man and ordered them to attack the incoming insurgents. In the meantime, the rebels from Cap Henri arrived at Ocap nine miles from the palace where they threw up hasty defenses here on sunday october 8th christoph's troops were under the command of prince joachim who opposed the insurgents but instead of obeying the order to attack they joined with the enemy prince joachim who alone remained faithful to his king turned and fled to the palace christoph who had anxiously awaited the outcome received news at 8 30 the same evening his personal troops had abandoned him he called his family to him exhorting them to show courage and resignation gave them an affectionate farewell Turning to Baron Dupuy, he said, Save yourself. My time is finished. A few minutes later, having asked his attendants to leave him, he shot himself in the heart. That same night, Baron Dupuy and Queen Maëlys Quavidad, accompanied by the two princesses and several others, secretly carried the king's body from the palace to the citadel, just in time to escape the bloodthirsty mob approaching the palace gates. Slowly, they bore the corpse of the king up the steep mountain trail to the citadel, where they arrived around midnight. It was there in the mountaintop fortress they buried the body of the first and only king of Haiti, the only black king the Western Hemisphere has ever seen. Fittingly, and perhaps by his own order, Christoph had become a part of his most extravagant work, the citadel, buried like an Egyptian king inside the damn pyramids. You dig? You see, y'all regular folk, y'all get buried in y'all little caskets with y'all little tombstones, your little headstones. Christoph got buried inside the damn fortress that he built over 100,000 square feet on top of a damn mountain. 3,000 feet above sea level. Listen, listen. Kings do big things, you dig? I told you, since Christoph was a young brother, he'd been doing it big. So it's only right. Let's get back into it. 
His death and downfall had been as spectacular and dramatic as his rise to power. Upon learning that the troops at Cap Henry were in open revolt, General Romain, who had been in open involvement with Marmalade's conspiracy, abandoned the siege of St. Mark and hurried north. After much contention, he was chosen provisional head of the proposed republic. The greatest disorder prevailed. Prince Jacques Victor Henri, heir to the throne, Prince Eugene, Christophe's natural son, and a number of others were brutally murdered in the prison yard on the night of October 18th. But the lives of the queen and the two princesses were spared. The conspirators had won their first objective, the destruction of the kingdom. But they were soon to discover that it is easier to overthrow a government than to establish a new one. While these events were in progress, President jean pierre Boyer, mulatto president of the Southern Republic, marched into the king's territory at the head of a large army, over 20,000 men, and took possession of St. Mark. Although he had not instigated the insurrections, he seized the opportunity to reunite Haiti under one government. Romain, Mamlad, and the other leaders of the revolution tried to stall him and sent a message indicating that they were setting up a republic to replace the fallen monarch. They pointed out that they had come into possession of the letters and papers concerning the attempt of Sir Homerick's Puffam to establish cordial relations between Christophe's kingdom and the republic. In these documents, they asserted Boyer had manifested his desire to have his government recognized by that of Christophe, and he had declared that he would not interfere in any manner with the regime in the north. Boyer, however, was not to be turned aside from his resolution and sent word that he demanded the absolute submission of all the chiefs in the north. He thereupon continued his march toward Cap Henri with 20,000 men, and the insurgents, capitulating to his demands, hastily proclaimed him president on October 21st, 1820. On the 28th, Boye arrived and incorporated the former kingdom into the republic. He appropriated Christophe's private as well as public treasury, abolished all titles and distinction, alternated the names of Cap Henri and the Citadel Henri to Cap Haitien and Citadel La Ferrière, and after a military tour through the country, returned to Port-au-Prince. The last vestiges of Christophe's monarchy had been obliterated. Thus, the magnificent plans of Henry Christophe came to an end. All work stopped at his death. The laborers left the fields until... The workers on the citadel dropped their tools. An enormous cannon being brought up the mountain to the fortress was abandoned halfway up the summit, where even today it can be seen in the jungle. The schools were immediately closed. The white teachers who Clarkson and Wilberforce had so painfully selected were left with neither students nor salary. The soldiers broke discipline and soon became careless. Swarms of idlers and vagrants flooded the roads. Abundance was replaced by destitution, the iron hand, the invincible will, the insatiable ambition of the king, it was all gone. The people had their freedom. The tyrant was dead. But for many a year, black men and women spoke of him simply as Lom. And looking up as the mighty citadel on gazing on the palace of Saint Souci, remembering the former days of prosperity, the king was gone. So yes, we could end part four right there. And in the next chapters, we are going to get into the actual government letters, government documents from Christoph and the other foreign diplomats and head of state. You know, it is what it is, man. We One day we got to talk about the jealousy amongst black men, right? At the end of the day, call it what you want. People want to put all types of reasoning to it, say that he was a tyrannical leader. It is what it is, man. That was the greatest leader that you ever had. And now that he's gone, I know you feel it. So at the end of the day, the true cause of the overthrow was because dudes was jealous. It even says it in the book. Though many generals in the army owed to Kristoff their wealth and power and position in society, they were jealous. Why were they jealous? Because at the end of the day, they remember back in 1791, this was the, you know, the young dude, the young 23, 24 year old dude who, you know what I mean? Who was selling horses, working in the hotel, you know, the big bougie dude. And now he became the general of the army and now he's the king. And they probably always been jealous of Christoph, bro. They probably always been jealous of him, especially the ones that came from the sugarcane plantations who they never got to, you know, experience freedom like Christoph did traveling to the United States for the American Revolution, getting money, earning money, dating the daughter of a rich, powerful man. You know, Christoph always been that dude, bro. So jealousy amongst black men was the cause of the end of the kingdom of Haiti, bro. It was jealousy. Call it what you want. It was just jealousy, bro. They wanted his position. They wanted to live in the palace, bro. Why he got to live in the palace, not me. Why? I thought we all fought in the revolution. Why he got to have the, you know what I mean, the big chariot, the big, you know, diamond pendant. Why he got to have everything? Why he got to shine? Why does he get to have the access to the most beautiful women in all of the kingdom? Because, I mean, of course, yeah, I mean, we had the, the queen, you know, yeah, but, you know, Christoph, I mean, come on, man. We, what's understood don't got to be explained, bro. You already know Christoph up in the Citadel probably was, you know what I mean, bringing girls up to the Citadel. <laughs> Listen, man, Christoph had like 10 houses, okay? His main two houses was the palace and the citadel, but he had a bunch of estates scattered all over the kingdom, okay? So, Christoph had a lot of different things going on, you dig? They even said it. They assassinated his son a week later 
and they also assassinated one of the sons by his mistresses. So it is what it is, man. Um, you know, dudes is jealous. You know, dudes is jealous. And what did y'all do when y'all took over the kingdom? Y'all gave it up to the mulattoes. Y'all gave it up to uh, Jean Pierre Boyer. He marched in with twenty thousand troops, and y'all didn't put up no fight. So y'all ready to cut the throat of your brother? And then when the mulatto generals came through from the south, you capitulated and you bowed down. I mean, if that's what you were going to do, you might as well have just crossed over the border and just became a citizen of the Republic of the South like many people already did. I mean, that was nothing new. People switch allegiances. There were people from the Republic who was like, man, I'm not rocking with this, man. They broke down here, bro. Like, I'm going up to the kingdom, man. The kingdom, they got, they having schools popping. They having, you know, theaters, all type of art academies, bro. They got everything lit in the kingdom, bro. I'm going to the kingdom, bro. I'm out. And then there were people living in the kingdom that was like, bro, this is too much. Like, man, I'm lazy, bro. Like, I'm not trying to be, you know, working six days a week, bro. I don't want to build a country. I want to go down to, I want to go down south and get drunk and party with the homies. You know what I mean? Where we don't got to do nothing. We just free walking around being bummy. Let's go down to the south where the mulatto generals got control. There were a lot of people switching back and forth. You know, so at the end of the day, if you wanted to do that, you could have just switched allegiances without having to overthrow the whole government just to do that. So you overthrew the king just to pledge allegiance to the Southern Republicans, bro. You dudes are idiots, man. You dudes are idiots. And that's why Kristoff was the one in power running everything for damn near 20 years. And y'all were following behind him because that was the role that you should have occupied. The role of the follower. All right. Damn. But anyways, man, listen, I just want to say. Thank y'all. I love y'all. My channel about to hit 500 subscribers. I've only been seriously uploading videos for about 60 days, like two months. And listen, when I first started seriously taking it serious, I was only maybe about 50 subscribers. So now we're about to hit 500 after two months. So much love to y'all. I ain't generated a dime yet because I'm not monetized. I got to get like a thousand subscribers and a certain amount of watch hours. And I'm about to get the watch hours. So, you know, at the rate I'm going, I'm probably going to hit a thousand real soon. It's going to be lit. It's going to be popping. Listen, please support. Hit the Cash App. Description in the bio. Much love, y'all. Listen, hit the Cash App support until I get monetized. We can get it popping. Also, YouTube takes about 30% of our revenue. So for everything to go straight to me, hit the Cash App in the description. I get everything. Everything black on. Support your brother. We're going to bring more content. And listen, stay tuned. We're not done. We are now going to go into the letters that he gave to foreign governments and the letters he received. We're going to read them all. Okay. It's going to be lit. I know y'all want that letter to the emperor of Russia. What did he say? Listen, stay tuned, bro. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. So it's going to be popping. Okay. It's going to be popping. This was part four. Listen, part one, we discussed the origins. Part two, the solidification of power. Part three, his interaction with France. Part four, the downfall and the death. And yes, the modern Republic of Haiti that marched into the kingdom of Haiti in 1820 and annexed that, that is the modern Republic of Haiti today. I already discussed in part three, the different styles of government between the kingdom and the Republic, how the Republic was poor and how the Republic remains poor still to this day due to the seeds planted by the original generals of the Republic 20 years ago. The kingdom no longer exists. It died with him. And um, listen, man, this needs to be a movie. Okay. You saw Kristoff died like a G. He said, listen, my time is done. He said goodbye to his family. He was like, listen, I'm out, man. My time is done. Took out his gun, out his waistband. Bang, nigga. You know what I'm saying? I'm out, bro. I'm out. You know what I'm saying? My time here is done. He hasn't taken a day off in like over 30 years. You know what I mean? Living stressed. It is what it is, man. It is what it is. A lot of people don't know. In 1802, when the French sent the expedition to reconquer the island, the first port that they landed in was Christoph's port in the northern section of Haiti. That was the first meeting between the two armies when French sent those like 50,000 soldiers and all those warships to go conquer the island and put everybody back in slavery. Christoph was commanding that northern port and the French general met him first. That was the first interaction between the two. And Christoph reacted. How did he react? Of course, Kristoff back then was living in a mansion back then. You know what I mean? Everything was lit. He was like, what, 1802? So he had to be about uh, 35 years old. As soon as Kristoff saw the French warships, he burned his mansion to the ground. Burned the whole city to the ground. Told his generals, yo, burn everything down. We out. We, we going to the mountains. We out. And then took a bunch of French hostages as ransom. You know what I mean? So basically saying, listen, if you attack, nigga, it's over. All these beautiful, you know, French men and women and children. You know what I mean? You you say the wrong thing. You do the wrong thing, bro. We, we slicing the throats. You understand? That was back in 1802, 18 years before his death. So Christoph hasn't taken a day off, bro, in a very long time. In a very long time, bro. A very long time. I mean, his life has been full of action ever since he went to Savannah, Georgia for the siege of Savannah during the American Revolution, bro. He's just been on go. He never took a rest, bro. So, you know, hopefully the king resting in peace now, you know what I mean? Because he deserve it, bro. He deserve to sleep. You know, he deserved to finally kick back and relax, man. It is what it is. It's your boy, Nefakari Desaline. 
back in the building. Yes, indeed. Rest in power, King Henry. We out. Stay tuned for more. Reincarnated, I'm back in original fashion. I left on a horse and came back in that ass. And I left with abundance and came back to famine. We used to be pyramids, now we be rapping. Look how the mighty have fallen. Used to be running, sh now we be walking. When you be cooning, that's when they applauded. Selling your soul, your sons and your daughter. Gotta come up in this shit. They stuck in the mix. Really, my heart would be breaking. That's why I'm stacking that paper and handle my business. Pass it down in generation. Talking about money and power and building a nation. That's a deadly combination. Never be watching the TV, they pushing the genus. Falsifying information. Know they got malice intentions. Step in the room and I'm feeling the tension. Enemy watching me, blocking my vision. Pay for the check, cause I need my redemption. Building my kingdom, I need it protected. Ready for war like a young money Congo. Never decided the team is the motto. Up in the crib and I'm whipping up waffles. Up in the crib and I'm smoking gelato. I'm chilling, I'm taking my pain and make it ambition. I'm blessed by the gods, but I ain't religious. I came for the power, they came for the bitch. They making no hourly wage. I got business. This shit is an art, and they can never be taught. Selling my soul, I can never be bought. Play with my money, I see you ain't caught. Run to the check and I do it for sport Babylon falling, I go to the source Packing my luggage and go overseas Shorty be with me and she so at least Shorty be chugged and I'm calling her Hershey Secret intelligence probably gon' murk me Don't fuck with brands cause nigga I'm Haitian Say the wrong shit and you're smacking their faces